Hello, people out in the uh, web world. This is Howard Mandel. I'm president of the Jazz Journalists Association, and I'm here on the third of the JJ's Talking Issues uh, webinars, panel discussions, uh, joined tonight by Michael Faison, who's the executive director of the Idaho Commission of the Arts, uh, Jennifer uh, Johnson Washington, who's program director at um, the Mayor's Office of Special Events in Chicago, where she coordinates the Chicago Jazz Festival, and Cedric Hendricks, a Washington-based lawyer who uh, has many uh, quivers in his bow. No, yes, many quivers in his bow. But uh, uh, notably is a former uh, staffer for Representative John Conyers. And uh, we're talking tonight about government funding for the arts, at the federal, at the state, and at the local municipal level. Um, this is Talking Jazz Issues is a series that's brought to you uh, through the good auspices of the Jazz Cruise, uh, which is going to depart from uh, Florida at the end of um, January for five days of cruising, and uh, we think it should be fun, and also Century Media Partners. So tonight um, we're going to talk about uh, the funding that's going on now, and I want to begin by asking Jennifer uh, if you could talk a little bit about the funding that goes in to the Chicago Jazz Festival, or that the Mayor's Office of Special Events receives, where, where is that funding coming from? Right, so the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events now, uh, we merged the Mayor's Office of Special Events and Cultural Affairs will merge together about a year ago. So now we're the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. Um, we produce many of the lakefront festivals in the city, but the Chicago Jazz Festival, the basic funding is through are, um, is allocated from our city budget for the festival. Uh, additional funding we get from various um, corporate sponsors and then um, philanthropic dollars that we get that we apply for through, through various groups, uh, the Chicago Community Trust, Boeing, Donnelly, MacArthur. And so that's the money that produces the Jazz Festival. Do you know whether funding uh, that comes from the budget, from the city budget, is um, passed on from either state or federal uh, sources? Uh, the, the city budget is city funds from city tax dollars, and that's the basic funding of all the festivals. And so um, that's allocated annually. You know, you know, city council votes on our funding, and that's the seed money for the festival. And then we have a, a corporate sponsorship team that goes after a marketing dollars and then our programming partner, the Chicago, um, the Jazz Institute of Chicago, applies for funding on behalf of the festival um, since they're a 501c3. I see. I see. There's many agencies that won't fund the city directly because we're a government agency. I see. Um, I'm going to jump over Michael for a moment to go to Cedric and ask you uh, whether, well, just to define uh, whether uh, the government at the federal level is funding uh, arts projects or institutions that end up uh, channeling money towards jazz projects? Well, uh, good evening. I would like to say that certainly Chris is, uh, notwithstanding all you hear about budget cuts, continuing to spend taxpayers' dollars. And uh, we should all have every confidence that as we um, even move through the budgetary drama that will yet again unfold in January, uh, whether it be through a continuing resolution uh, or a uh, regular spending bill that carries us forward through the remainder of the fiscal year, a lot of dollars are going to get spent. This is good news. Uh oh, Cedric seems to have frozen for a uh, And fighting every day. And our programs, uh, we just got to get out there and our share. Uh, the endowment for the arts is still around. Uh, it obviously has received uh, significant cuts, uh, but we have seen uh, advocacy protect um, uh, its funding stream, and I am uh, among those who will be uh, fighting for um, additional funding for uh, jazz in particular in the year ahead. I see. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, we need you fighting for that additional funding, I think. Michael, um, introduce yourself and the jazz element of uh, your your mission in Idaho. 
Well, we're, uh, I'm the director of the Idaho Commission on the Arts, and this is a state agency uh, in the state of Idaho, and we're one of 56 uh, such agencies around the country with states and uh, territorial jurisdictions. Um, you know, we're both a funder and a fundee. Uh, we receive about half of our appropriation through the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, through the state partnership grant, and then the other half uh, from our state legislature through appropriation of state funds. And um, uh, we provide programs and services uh, that support the vitality of the arts around the state. Now, um, the jazz element of that is that um, uh, certainly there are uh, organizations and programs that, um, that present jazz uh, to the public here. Uh, a, a wonderful example of that would be uh, the Lionel Hampton uh, Jazz Festival up in Moscow, Idaho. And uh, we, uh, we make grants to these entities to support uh, to access uh, by them to uh, to the public, or how can I put it, uh, to support uh, their public programs in the arts. Now, most of our grant making does go out through uh, through not-for-profit organizations around the state. Uh, in fact, I th I would say that's pretty typical. It's very rare that a grant maker today can go to an individual, you know, make grants to individuals. But we are able to make grants to support public programs through not-for-profit organizations across the state. Are, are you able to make grants to municipalities? Because yes. So in Jennifer is saying that uh, the city of Chicago is uh, not able to receive funding uh, directly. Um, uh, Jennifer, you don't receive any money from the Illinois Arts Council? Mm -hmm. No, it, it's often that, I mean, the Illinois Arts Council, yes, we have received funding from in the past. Um, it's just there are many groups that will not fund a government agency. Um, I should say the um, Chicago um, Community Trust is one that would fund directly to us. I see. I so see. they're just fewer. I see. So um, I think that gives us a little bit of a sense of the... Uh, landscape that we'll be talking about tonight in greater depth. Cedric, I must say your, your uh, statement uh, faded in and out a little bit when I was listening to you. So um, what I gathered that you were saying was that uh, despite the uh, looming uh, budget um, threat again from our Congress, I guess, um, there will be money spent. There are being monies that have been allocated. And uh, they will continue. The programs will continue. That's that's what you were saying, wasn't it? That is that's my message, and I think it is, is an imperative that those of us in this uh, jazz community advocate for what we want. Because if we don't, the money will go elsewhere. And uh, we're going to be working on a new to uh, fund some specific pieces in the area of preservation and education, and hopefully in an area that I call promulgation, which also I think can be uh, represented. I lost you again. Collaboration, networking, collective advocacy, perhaps we can be successful. Mm -hmm. um, I should tell our attendees that if you have questions, you may please type them in uh, to the box that you see on your screen, and I will uh, introduce those questions into the conversation at the appropriate moments, best I can. So, um, Cedric, will you talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, legislation that um, I guess Representative Conyers introduced in 2011 and you want to introduce again? Am I being heard? Speak up, anybody? Well, certainly. Um, the bill that was introduced previously was H.R. 2823, and it was known as, as the National Jazz Preservation and Education Act. And we were in the process of putting the bill, the previous version of it was introduced in the last Congress. Bills have an essential uh, two year life, that is, they run the term of a we're in the 13th Congress bill be introduced again, um, if not by the end of the year, certainly early next year. What we're trying to do is expand the scope of it from preservation and education to also include culture, that is the creation, the promulgation of the music. Um, we've had in uh, Mr. Conyers' office success over the past 
in securing funding for JAS, specifically uh, programmatic activities at the Smithsonian Institution. We're all, I'm sure, with the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks, which is now over 20 years old. Uh, that institution was funded through some specific uh, fundraising effort through the appropriation con uh, con appropriations uh, process that Mr. Con took. And uh, I believe that more can be accomplished. When, when funds are uh, uh, appropriated um, through the uh, congressional process, uh, they're earmarked for the NEA, but they're like, for instance, with the NEA funds, it's a certain percentage of that earmarked for jazz and another percentage for, say, European concert music or, you know, classical music or anything like that? Well, I'm glad you mentioned earmarks, Howard, because certainly the success we've had in the past through specific earmarks. Uh, I even recall along the way, though we weren't so uh, much involved in it, that the University of Idaho got some uh, appropriations earmark for uh, the Lionel Hampton program. Uh, some may know that Willis uh, was in securing. I'm, I'm still having dropouts. What we have to do is look for uh, programmatic initiatives, and this is what we attempted to do through this bill, uh, where we are, for example, in the education area, attempting to amend. Uh, some of the authorizing legislation at the uh, Department of Education that is in particular. I'm, I'm going to the schools program uh, as well as the Jazz Ambassadors program. So we are not creating a new program. We're trying to tweak the authorization for an existing program and authorize some specific jazz-related purpose. I see. I think I used the term earmark. Uh, uh, too loosely. I, I really meant designated for, you know, as opposed to what we know or have heard about as as legislative earmarks, particular things. But when when um, I, I'll have, ask it again. When uh, funds are sent to the NEA, appropriate for the NEA, is there a designation that a certain percentage of that uh, go to fund jazz, another percentage to fund classical concert music, another percentage to fund uh, ballet or something like that, or are you know, those decisions no. made at the administrative level in the NEA? Those decisions are administrative level determinations at the NEA. In fact, I, I might at present that. anyway. Yeah. Michael, go ahead. Yeah, because um, uh, I know a little bit about the, the, the administrative workings of the endowment. Um, no, they do not uh, specify specific amounts of money uh, or appropriation to specific disciplines, artistic disciplines, um, but rather, uh, instead, it's, it's broken into some other areas. For instance, 40% uh, of their program budget actually goes straight out the door to the states and territories in what most people would be, uh, call a block grant, but are, are called the state and regional partnership agreements. And so the, they, uh, they, forty percent right off the top goes right out the door, and uh, and then the states and territories determine how to best use those in those states and territories, and then the remaining amount of the program budget um, is simply divided up into the other areas. Now, um, uh, for instance, edu arts education would be one of those areas, uh, and then there will be some initiatives such as uh, the Big Read and Poetry Out Loud and others. Um, um, but uh, as far as uh, designating uh, appropriation, say, for jazz versus um, uh, concert classical music, something like that, I'm, I'm, I can be pretty certain that they actually don't make that distinction at the endowment. Of course, I, should, I'm not, I don't work for the endowment, so, uh, 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 but I, I do have a pretty good knowledge of their workings. Jennifer, does that uh, run a... a along the lines that you understand things happening to? You get yeah, well, involved you know, in this process? The Chicago Jazz Festival, as a presenter, our, our appropriation comes from our you know city budget. To grow our programming is how we started applying for philanthropic dollars to help expand um, 
the budgets that we were given because although we have a wonderful four day free festival, you know, you always want to expand on that. We're in our thirty sixth year, we're headed into our thirty sixth year now. And so our funding from philanthropic dollars from the funders is what we use to grow our event by doing artist residencies, um, moving programming into the neighborhoods, all of that wouldn't be possible without those monies. Cedric, will the if if the um uh, promulgation uh, bill passes. Uh, would some of those funds eventually be hitting um, the na if the National Jazz Preservation and Education Act that you mentioned passes? Would those funds be uh, directed toward municipalities? Well, here's the thing: in the preservation part, right now, it focuses on the Smithsonian, and uh, one of the things that I think we're looking to do as we revise the bill is to make it possible for that money to get pushed out of Washington into communities across the country. That was one of the things that we heard uh, in the wake of the introduction of the original bill. Uh, as it relates to the education portion of the bill, uh, that would provide authorization for jazz related funding through the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. And certainly anybody across the country that would then be in a position to submit proposals to the U.S. Department of Education to secure some portion of uh, that author and certainly with the, the promulgation part what we're hoping to do is to foster the creation of the music around the country by um, supporting uh, artists as small business people uh, in creating market the music good <laughs> Michael is working in the marketplace something that the Idaho Commission is involved in also very much so, actually. In fact, uh, you know, we're we're a very small population state with a very small arts agency. I mean, I came to Idaho from Pennsylvania, where it was quite the opposite. And um, uh, you know, we make grants, but if we were solely a philanthropy, we'd be an awfully tiny one. We're a government agency, and uh, and our job, in addition to making grants, is to provide for the the vitality of an arts marketplace. And as, um, as you were saying, uh, the, these artists are in fact small business people. They're, they're entrepreneurs, they're, they're uh, uh, sole proprietorships. And in the arts, as in any field of endeavor, there are certain issues of, of that business that have to be tended to to be successful in the business. And we try to provide those kinds of business services in our state so that um, uh, the artists of any discipline, jazz included, uh, and I would say musicians more than anybody else probably are attuned in to the fact that they work in a marketplace. Um, they have the kinds of tools, professional tools, they need to be successful in that, uh, uh, whether as an individual or as an ensemble. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we, we get heavily involved in that in trying to train, uh, uh, train, that sounds a bit uh, a term, but... Um, to provide these kinds of resources so that people can be successful in a music business. Um, Jennifer, I don't think that your department in Chicago is involved directly with um, entrepreneurs within the Chicago area, is it? Um, actually, it is. We, we have... Um an arts programming team that work to nurture emerging artists and help them, you know, with with presenting their works and hiring them for, you know, the Chicago Jazz Festival, over 50% of the festival is reserved for local artists. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we're, we're always trying to align up and coming artists with a more established artist. And so that way the audience gets to see, you know, emerging artists as well as well established artists. I, this sounds like a, uh, a cruel of the kind of uh, interest that, Cedric, you say that the jazz uh, uh, fans have to do lobbying to get what we want. And to show that there's this kind of vitality within the jazz community uh, that, that Jennifer points to works with and that Michael is also talking about, these are the bodies of the, the vital people who we need to somehow marshal and... and turn into lobbyists for jazz. Is that the case? That is absolutely the case. Uh, many, of course, remember House Concurrent 
from 57, which Congressman Conyers introduced back in, gee, passed by the Congress back in 1987. Um, it, in fact, it passed the House of Representatives on September 23rd, which we all know is John Cole Crane's birthday. Yes. Uh, it passed the Senate uh, in December of that year. We worked with uh, former Senator Alan Cranston from California to get the bill passed there. Now, what was essential to getting that bill passed, and keep in mind that bill just said something profound about jazz. It says, jazz is rare and valuable national American treasure. What we then had to do was to get artists, presenters from across the country to remember of Congress and say, Congressman Conyers has this bill in the House of Representatives. Senator Cranston has this bill in the Senate. Now, I'm here in, uh, let's say, Montana. And uh, Mr. Congressman, you're my congressman. If you want my support next November when you're running, I need you to support Mr. Conyers' jazz bill. Or same message to the senator. And so those communications were made in writing, uh, by telephone, and then what we began was co-sponsorship. What co-sponsorship involves is a member of Congress has to get in touch with the clerk's office, uh, in their respective House of Congress and say, put my name down as a co-sponsor of a particular bill. Nobody can do it for them. It has to come from their office. And then those names begin to stack up. So when you go into uh, Ferrier Congress Thomas system to check out the status of a bill, it'll list the sponsors. And what you hope to see over the course of months is every month the number of co-sponsors go up. We all know, for example, that it takes about 218 members of the House of Representatives to pass a bill. That's a, a majority of the House. So if you get 200 co-sponsors, that shows you've got a broad base of support. That sends a signal to the leadership, maybe we need to schedule that bill. Now, it certainly could be the case that even bills with a whole lot of support go nowhere because political decisions get made by leadership, but that they don't want it to move. But by building a base of support, and what I have found with respect to jazz is you can get bipartisan support. We have Republicans and Democrats that all love this music and are comfortable putting their name down in support of it. And that's the way we over and over again. Uh, and then looking to do a bill. So when this bill gets reintroduced, it will have a new bill number. Mr. Conyers will send out a, uh, what they call a dear colleague letter that goes to all of the members of the House of Representatives, putting them on notice about the bill and inviting them to be a co-sponsor of the bill. Now, they get these letters day in and day out, but then what causes them to pull it out the stack and pay a little more attention is when they say, well, gee, haven't we gotten a few letters about this one? Uh, didn't some of my constituents come up to me when I was doing a town meeting back in the day after this jazz? Take money to be spent, you know, in this environment, I, I really don't want to put my name next to anything like that. Well, but when they're hearing from their constituents that, well, you're supporting other federal spending for bombs, missiles, whatever, I believe in jazz. I think it's a, a, an important aspect of American culture, and if you want my support, you need to show your support. That's the mm -hmm. message that they need to hear. That, that's the way it works. I worked on the Hill for 15 years, and I saw this process utilized over and over. And all I've done is take this process into the jazz community and, in fact, have some success uh, over a number of years getting uh, things done. Some of you may uh, know about the uh, Jazz Appreciation Month activity that the Smithsonian Institution is involved in. That, too, was hatched through congressional legislation. Um, and so I think it is an important place to focus our efforts. Not that we should be working at the uh, municipal level or at the state level, because certainly there's dollars uh, being appropriated through the legislative bodies at those respective levels. But the Congress is the big gorilla. And that's where uh, billions and billions of our tax dollars are. And if there's no, and, and you know, you've got with the American Council for the Arts, you've got, you know, national arts. Uh, advocacy efforts that are around here trying to keep money for the uh, endowment or, you know, we saw a successful effort, for example, a year or so ago fighting to save the Jazz Masters program. Right. That was a successful effort and surprisingly 
uh, I was contacted. And, and if you think about the and if you think about the old Congress resolution, it talked again about jazz being a national American treasure that should be preserved, understood, and innovated. So those three things are really what we built this new bill around. Preservation, you know, uh, trying to, to enhance not just the Smithsonian's ability to continue to acquire the artifacts of the masters, and, and I should say um, uh, that I was at the Smithsonian when Lionel Hampton did a there. Then when Dizzy Gillespie donated uh, one of his flare bell trumpets to the Smithsonian, uh, I was there for a lot of those of things. I want to see that stuff in the Smithsonian where it's on exhibit and my kids can put their arms around it rather than see it wind up in, in Bonn, Germany, uh, Tokyo, Japan, uh, or other places around where people love and uh, and appreciate his music. So, um, so we've got to put that forward, but in the new bill, we want to ensure that, let's say, was it the American Jazz Museum in Kansas City can get money through this process as well. They out there have Charlie Parker's, or at least one of Charlie Parker's alto saxophones. Uh, they're trying to acquire other artifacts uh, that are important, not just from the Kansas City community, but from artists elsewhere, uh, because they do have a capacity to exhibit that stuff and make it available and accessible to the public. I'm trying to, uh, from uh, uh, an institution that everybody loves and is familiar with, the Smithsonian, the nation's treasure, on a will be a Smithsonian, what's important to and out America. So my goal originally with Mr. Conyers was to make sure that the Smithsonian had a focused, robust jazz program, which it now does. Jazz Appreciation Month, the Jazz Master Works Orchestra, those are all uh, outcomes of legislative activity that people in the jazz community undertook that said, to say, this is important, put some resources on Michael and Jennifer, are you aware of the promulgation and preservation bill? Is that something you've been contacted about so that, you know, you could do some lobbying on your ends for this? No, I'm, I'm not personally familiar with it, though I feel like I should know about it and encourage our audience to support in any way possible. Same here. Yeah. yeah so, I, I've not uh, had any uh, involvement in it. I haven't been aware of it, but it's uh, it sounds uh, extremely important to me. And, uh, and as uh, Cedric but, was but saying, we're, we're, uh, the description of you know, this should move forward is exactly right. So, Cedric, is there a problem in terms in terms of letting uh, uh, people like Michael and, and Jennifer at their levels know that this is coming up so that lobbying can begin to uh, happen within these communities? Well, one of the things that we certainly have to do a better job with this time around is getting the word out in the jazz community. You know, not just focusing on members of Congress, you know, like to get Danny Davis from Chicago, who, of course, is a jazz lover to support the bill, uh, you know, but we've got to get folks like we're talking to today uh, to become more aware of it and do what we did before. For example, the first time around, um, we developed the House Concurrent Resolution working in collaboration with something called the National Jazz Service Organization. Some of you may remember that. It's not around anymore. It was an important organization that kind of hatched out of the National Endowment for the Arts um, that had a board, had members across the country, and we network through that. In fact, we also work with the old um, National Association with Jazz Educators. I mean, that 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 was uh, before it was IAJE. It was the National Association, and I remember uh, working in 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 tandem uh, with it. Uh, they put something in their their monthly magazine. I mean, you know, we um, are going to be pursuing those kinds of efforts through uh, networks within our. Uh, jazz community. Locally, nationally, we've got if we're going to be uh, uh, sick. I was shocked when the uh, threat uh, occurred to wipe out the um, and, uh, <laughs> the people power to get it done is, is yet the challenge. As I say, when, when the jazz masters were about to be um, ended by the NEA, I was contacted and asked who the service organization for jazz was that could organize lobbying effort 
to support uh, reinstating the Jazz Masters program. And at that point, uh, IAJE was no longer, it had imploded. And with, as you say, there's no National Jazz Service Organization. So, Michael and um, Jennifer, would it be useful to have a uh, jazz service organization, some sort of uh, independent entity that is, uh, you know, can can uh, launch, uh, organize such efforts, such lobbying? Absolutely. I mean, Chicago has a robust, you know, jazz audience and uh, presenters here. They would want to support, and I don't. I'm not sure that they know what to do, how to go about helping to lobby for this type of legislation. I, so, I would. I would agree. And that's why conversations like this are going. Yeah. I, IAJE was a uh, was a wonderful. I mean, we story. talked about it. For example. Well, Michael, talk uh, for a minute, second. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, the IAJE was a wonderful entity, and uh, is sad to see it not there now. Because um, not only um, could they be a voice nationally for jazz, but they also, of course, served as a conduit for jazz education, uh, which I think also, in the bigger picture, is is an essential essential piece of this. Um, so working uh, through students and teachers and their families uh, so that uh, this art form stays robust um, uh, ad infinitum. But there does need to be, a, um, there, there really does need to be some service entity that does look out for uh, the uh, jazz as a medium um, in this country. Because without that, uh, it, it really does sort of get lost in, in, in the void out there. And and that and that'd be a travesty. It is a travesty uh, because this is the American uh, musical form. Mm -hmm. But such a such a service organization itself would have a big challenge to get funded. That's why there is none, right? Oh, absolutely. Uh -huh. Service entities in general have a, a real problem getting funded because. You know, a producing organization can show something very clearly. This is what we do. This is how we serve people. Uh, a service organization is sort of wholesale, and it's very difficult to uh, convince um, others uh, to to provide contributed funding to to make these things viable. So frequently, they have to rely a great deal on on volunteerism, which is great in itself. But it's hard to sustain any efforts on pure volunteerism, you know, or, or like policy efforts over a long period of time. Indeed, it is. So, um, still, Cedric, it seems like the responsibility is at the federal level, and and as you're proposing legislation to make sure that uh, at the state level they know this is happening well in advance. And at the city level, also, they know this is happening well in advance because those state and uh, city levels are going to have to reach out to the citizens who are contacting their congresspeople and asking for the support of the legislation. Isn't that the case? But, but, but yeah, it is. But, but let me say this: when we worked on the uh, first bill, the House Concurrent Resolution 57, very fascinating things that unfolded was that. The bill, the the national bill, sparked efforts at the local level. Two examples: in New York City, there was a councilman named Wendell Foster, who in two resolutions for consideration by the city council there. One called upon Congress to pass the Conyers bill. The second proclaimed jazz to be a treasure of the city of New York, and so he held a hearing in the city council chamber on his two bills. It lasted 10 hours. I went and Mr. Conyers went. Three bands performed their testimony in of that <laughs> hearing, making their support of those bills. Later, in Philadelphia, city councilman by the name of Ed Schwartz, uh fancied himself to be a ragtime jazz pianist, introduced a resolution proclaiming jazz to be a treasure of the city of Philadelphia. At the Change that was tied to the announcement of the Mellon Jazz Festival there. And so they had a band club there. But what you saw in instances was people from the community make a political arena into the council chambers in the active city, interacting with nations around 
have legislation about jazz in their own particular community. What we then said to all of them was, don't stop. We appreciate the, the kind of the tip of the hat uh, with respect to the Conyers bill, but cement those relationships so that you can continue to be a presence in those council chambers working to impact how back in Detroit, the Detroit Council on the Arts is spending its money. Or the Chicago, uh, I mean, in, in, in any city, we have to have an active presence in the political process because that uh, leads to determinations regarding how public dollars are spent. It's hard enough to get patrons when we produce, but at the very least, public dollars, which actually are our tax dollars, is saying how they're spent. And it's all about prioritization. They don't hear from you, you're not a priority. If they do hear from you, the political council, they'll think about it when it's time to make decisions about where the money goes. You know, Michael, um, uh, I should say, Jennifer, it, it's clear Chicago has had a long, long, uh, vibrant uh, community and thousands of people show up every uh, August for the Jazz Festival. It's, uh, Michael, it seems like Idaho, we don't hear much about Idaho jazz as, you know, as center. So where is the... Um, a focus of that community. What kind of community have you got there? And does it actually have a political uh, leverage on decisions that are made at the state level? Well, uh, hard to say. Um, it has, it, Boise, and okay, I'm, first I'll, I'll go Idaho wide, then uh, focus on Moscow. Idaho wide, um, there's uh, it's a very small community. Jazz is a very small community in Idaho, and uh, and like most people, uh, the people in the jazz community frequently don't uh, know that the fact is, if you want to get something done, if you want to get legislation through or at least a policy direction made, you have to let your elected officials, whether at the local, state, or national level, know what it is you want. Mm -hmm. They actually do keep track of this. They want to be responsive to their constituents. And and, and they will they will count coup. You know, so this is how many people are are supporting this initiative. This is how many people are supporting that initiative. If you don't speak up, uh, it doesn't matter. So it, it goes back to the old thing, if you don't ask, the answer is no. Uh, <laughs> and uh, now, as for um, uh, now, I want to head up to Moscow, Idaho. It's a uh, university town. Uh, university of Idaho is there, and the University of Idaho has staunchly supported for for um, ages now the Lionel Hampton International Jazz Festival. That festival uh, brings in tens of thousands of people uh, at the worst possible time of the year, February. Uh, you can't get to Moscow, Idaho, in February. But they do it then every year, and when I ask the provost of the university why they do that, I mean, come on, guys, make it easy for us. They said, no, you don't understand. That's when the uh, band teachers uh, and the jazz band teachers can bring their kids. That's why we do it then. And so they get anywhere from five to 10,000 students coming from all over the western United States and western Canada, sleeping in sleeping bags on that campus uh, for nearly a week, for jazz, for master clinics all day long, and then uh, music all night long, um, and um, uh, so there is actually a huge constituency that's that's not speaking up. If every one of those people spoke up in support of some, if actually if they were given something to support, um, give them something to support, tell them what to do with that information, um, elected officials. Uh, wherever they live, if they if they live up in western Washington or up in Montana or down here in Idaho, they will speak up and they will speak their mind and say what's important to them. Uh, and until they do that, it doesn't matter. Well, it must make a huge financial difference to Moscow when yeah. everybody troops in. And isn't that obvious to, you know, all the entrepreneurs not only in Moscow, but the transportation and the uh, airlines, whatever? Absolutely. I mean, that, that town grows significantly in size during the festival, and people eat, and people stay in hotels. You can't get rooms in the hotels. 
um, uh, yeah, it's it's a great economic boon to that town. It really is. So does that make that a constituency that you know wants to make sure that the Idaho Commission on the Arts is aware of its uh, desire to support that project? Say again. Sorry. So does 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 that is that a commercial constituency then that if it were threatened by losing the festival it would get to you and say we cannot lose this festival oh yeah absolutely yes yeah. yeah yeah uh we would certainly um uh, we would certainly perk up and i believe our the legislators in idaho would really perk up too you know the fact is uh you know idaho um uh it's a red state and it's a very conservative state and people love the arts here. Uh, you know, all of this, none of this is partisan. Um, this is all nonpartisan, or you could say bipartisan. Um, uh, arts are good business. They also speak to the soul of our state as well as the soul of our nation. And I know of few things, few art forms out there, other uh, more so than jazz on that point. I mean, it's about the, the American soul. And the, and um, I can assure you that our public officials get that. I mean, our work has a strong support from the Idaho governor's office and our legislators. We do, um, because they understand that this is about the soul of Idaho and, and its people. And, um, uh, uh, and, it, and it's just good business, too. I mean, uh, yeah, if, if, if you lose a major event like that, you lose major business. People here don't want to lose major business. Right, right. Jennifer, are these um, conflicts? Well, that you just hear? as an example, I let me jump into Jennifer for just a minute, Cedric. Are are there conflicts within the uh, special events uh, uh, budgets about where those monies are going to go? There must be, and yet you in Chicago, as, as we said, there's clearly a large uh, community, and you have a service organization, right, in the in the Jazz Institute of Chicago. Right. Our, our, our partner from the very beginning, the last 35 years, has been the Jazz Institute of Chicago. But, um, you know, lucky for Chicago, our city council gets it. You know, the the cultural vibrancy of, the fest, uh, of our city, that's what our department is all about nourishing. So our blues festival, jazz festivals, um, and, and speaking of economic impact, we just had market research done this year. And the economic impact to the city of Chicago during the jazz festival is over six million dollars. Wow! So it's big business, and that's how we're, we're able to sustain for so long. So it, it, but it wouldn't be the job of you, Jennifer, or you, Michael, to to offer programs that then people lobby for and support, right? I mean, the Jazz Institute of Chicago can say, we want to have another festival, like in March, and we can uh, get uh, 100,000 signatures saying that this is a good idea, and that information is going to go up through the city council and reach the mayor's office, and then you have to decide, you know, somebody has to decide whether the budget is there. But that project can't, init can't begin with you, no. Jennifer. And no. Michael, you couldn't say either, I don't, or, or could you? Uh, uh, the Commission on the Arts wants to uh, float a statewide uh, tour uh, or something like that right after the Moscow Festival. We want to extend the uh, activity. That would have to come from outside your commission, wouldn't it? It would. It would have to come more from the grassroots. Uh, we would be, you know, we would have to respond. Um, but not really to tell people what it is that they should have, but rather when it comes from the grassroots, from people themselves, in uh, and not just in Moscow, but in other communities, saying that hey, this is this is so huge, we want a piece of that too. How can we work together on that? And if you start seeing a statewide consensus around that, then we're able to respond to that consensus. Now, Cedric, this is the problem when it seems to me jazz organizations or arts organizations come to Congress and say, we want the arts, and yet the result is uh, uh, the budget for the NEA uh, offered up in, in the bill is cut in half, which would de you know, devastate it. Or um, 
you know, this, the, the significant amount of stonewalling that goes on when there is lobbying for the things that you and I and Jennifer and Michael are very much in favor of. How, how can we break that, Rod I I think what happened is that the, the advocacy has to originate at the grassroots level. See, it's one thing for the American Council for the Arts to send letters all around saying, oh, please don't cut the endowment. You know, but every spring, I think, they have Arts Advocacy Day. And yeah. they try as best they can to get people from across the country to Washington and uh, go knock on the door of their member of Congress. Uh, that's helpful, but it, it works a whole lot better when people are working those members of Congress, House and Senate, back home. And, and, and going in and sitting down in their office and saying, hey, please put your behind this. Or again, catching them out in the community at those meetings or, or church socials or wherever you see them and talking up uh, the importance of culture and, and its role in our economy and um, the need resources uh, uh, to support it. So that's where it matters. I mean, when, you know, these members of Congress, they get lobbied all the time. And one of the things they do is, is insulate themselves from it with their staff. Yeah, and and they're, they're, believe me, there are levels of that reflect how uh, close to the throne you get. If you get the intern, you're not viewed as very important. If you get the legislative duck, if you get the legislative director, well, you they're listening to you. And if you get the chief of staff or the congressman or senator, well, you really get it. And so how do you accomplish that? Those are the kinds that we need to be attentive to as we endeavor to carry our message forward where it is heard best, make sure it's heard uh, most often or a lot, um, and then uh, make sure that you convey that there might be a consequence politically if appropriate support is not shown at the appropriate time. Let me ask you if you think that journalism and media can play a significant role in... Um, uh, oh, absolutely. Uh, the jazz educator, educator work. Uh, great organization, but it's a it's the nonprofit. Uh, uh, the music uh, educators, you know, are interested in this. Uh, I want to organizations that integrity by engaging in what is considered lobbying and uh, viewed perhaps as inappropriate and uh, threatening to uh, uh, put you in trouble with the Internal Revenue Service. So to have jazz journalists writing about this and helping to get the word out to our constituency, that is especially important because you're not at risk the way nonprofits are abused of lobbying uh, to impact legislation and appropriation. So, you know, I will certainly be coming forward to you, Howard, and, and this network again, you know, once we have uh, moved forward with the bill uh, and are prepared to introduce it, to get the word out so that people know about it better than they did when we did this a few years ago. Is it possible that that would happen in April? Will the bill be introduced by April, Cedric? Uh-oh. Oh, oh yeah. I, I missed some of what you said, but you, you focused on April. I certainly expect this bill is going to be introduced well before that. Uh, so it can be part of the, the arts advocacy agenda. Um, but, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, again, going to be looking to tap into all of the works. For example, a month ago, I had the opportunity here in Washington to uh, be on a panel discussion at the Future of Music Coalition's conference at Georgetown University. And uh, there amongst those in attendance was uh, Peter Gordon, who's with the Jazz Forward Coalition. They were about much the same thing we're, we're speaking about here today. And there were people there from around the country. Uh, talk, you know, we talked about a lot of things. At base, we talked about the essential role advocacy can play in advancing our interests, and protecting our interests. Um, and so, 
you know, uh, some may remember uh, Stokely Carmichael, also known as Kwame Ture. You know, he would always say, organize, organize, organize. And that's what we have to do. And whether it's through formal organization like Jen uh, or uh, through Jazz Journalists Association, you know, we need, uh, or the Jazz Forward Coalition, we need to attach ourselves to, to those kinds of entities and support them, encourage them, direct them. Uh, but at the base level, just as an individual uh, jazz lover, jazz artist, um, jazz uh, concert patron, you know, I've got a voice that I can ensure gets heard by putting pen to paper and writing my elected representatives and saying, this is important to me. Uh, and and I'm going to hold you accountable uh, for supporting it or not. So so there's a lot that all of us can do um, because you know again government at all levels continue to function, continue to central roles in our lives, and most importantly continue to spend our tax dollars. Mm -hmm. And all I'm suggesting is let's have some say in how those dollars are spent, and through you know marshalling the collective voice of our community, uh, saying spit on jazz say that. And some plan successful. In fact, not just forms, but even even before you know, we started working on this series of Conyers bills that that brought dollars to the Smithsonian. I remember working with Congressman Lou Stokes from Cleveland, Ohio, when he was working in the late '80s to get money for the acquisition of the Duke Ellington stuff for the Smithsonian, and he was after a million dollars to enable the Smithsonian to buy the Ellington stuff from the uh, Ellington family. And they were able, he got half a million dollars, they bought the stuff, that led to the creation of an exhibition called Beyond Category, The Musical Genius of Duke Ellington, which first posted up here in Washington, then traveled the country. I, for one, had the great uh, benefit, the great joy of being in the back room where some of the so caressing a Grammy awarded to Duke Ellington. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's all about. Yeah. Couldn't do that in Tokyo, but that's what can happen here through... And I have heard many concerts of the Jazz Master Works Orchestra. They have performed at the White House. They performed on the, uh, the, what is it, the Giza Plaza in Egypt, taking this music around the world. That orchestra, now 20-something years old, is a consequence of political advocacy focused specifically on jazz, which led to the creation of a jazz institution that's over two decades old. We need to make that happen again and again at the local level and at the national level. Um, let me put in a little plug for the Jazz Journalists Association for the moment. We're involved in a campaign called Jazz April. This is presumably this is the second year of it. And this is a media campaign in which we are trying to get uh, all the uh, players in localities to uh, come together and show their muscle and their interest in jazz. Jennifer, I think you know about this because we've had jazz heroes in Chicago for several years running now. Uh -huh. So last year we had 25 cities, North American cities, all but one in the U.S., that had parties that put up jazz heroes that... Um, uh, found proclamations from their mayors about the uh, vitality of jazz in their communities. Now, it seems like from what Cedric's saying, we should try to organize the uh, coverage of that stuff and send it to Washington, or send it to Boise, or send it to Champaign, um, uh, um, Springfield, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and to let the uh, legislators at every level know that the things that we did in April uh, to, to, to gather large grassroots support, that that support can be converted into some lobbying effort. Would, th would that sort of thing uh, work for you, Jennifer? Work for you, Michael? No, absolutely. Yeah. If, so if you could receive those testimonials, more or less, that would be a good thing. We should work yes. on that. We should work on that. Jennifer, what what do you take to, or, or are you responsible for even being in the conversation about how to approach philanthropists or uh, institutions, uh, funders that maybe have not been uh, into jazz before? Are you involved in those conversations? Um, well, I'll tell you, the, the Chicago Jazz Festival has received philanthropic dollars for only the last few years. 
Um, and Pat, in the in the past, I mean, sponsorship, corporate dollars, marketing dollars is what we went after. It's only in the last five years or so that we've gone after philanthropic dollars to help stretch our budget. So it's a little bit new to us. Um, it, it's also a little bit difficult because of trying to tailor a program to receive funds and match it to your festival are not always that easy to come by. So uh, we are fortunate in Chicago to have the Chicago Jazz Partnership, um, a group of, of different funders that have come together to support jazz in Chicago. So that really was our first introduction into philanthropic dollars into supporting our festival. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. And, it, and, you know, really the, the Jazz Institute of Chicago has really spearheaded that effort on our behalf. I see. Michael, are you responsible for fundraising to expand on, the, uh, on your budget? Interestingly, statutorily, we're not allowed to fundraise. Uh, so uh, we, we're not allowed to bring in private dollars to our agency, though we try to be as helpful as we can for other entities, say the direct arts entities in the states, uh, to receive funds. So when we're in a position to assist in that way, uh, to direct private funds to um, so like a presenting organization or something of the sort or some arts effort, we, we do that. Um, but we actually statutorily are not allowed to fundraise uh, for our agency. Now, for the endowment, for instance, in, in recent years, the endowment, the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, uh, the, uh, I don't know whether you'd say it's statutory changes or, or administrative rules changes, but they have actually built good alliances with private funders to achieve certain initiatives of the endowment. Uh, the first one that comes out and, and, and it comes up to me is the Poetry Out Loud work that's so phenomenal that they do around the country, which they work with the Poetry Foundation. And uh, most of the funds actually come through the Poetry Foundation. They're not actually endowment funds. Um, but uh, so the endowment actually has some flexibility there and the ability to raise funds today in a way that perhaps they weren't uh, able to uh, in generations past and I think that could be a great benefit uh, as uh, you know, I'd say the, the cultural agency of our country uh, to take a leadership role in, in certain initiatives and, and I sure, sure wouldn't object if they were taking, taking such an initiative in, in the world of jazz. Well, first we have to have a director of the NEA appointed, though, right? Very <laughs> true. Yeah. Um, is there a non-governmental organization, uh, I guess you mentioned the university, uh, but that also partners with the Idaho Commission on the Arts to support music performance or, you know, maybe not even uh, genre-specific? You don't have an, uh, a music industry, so to speak, in Idaho, do you? Not really, not really. We have a very good relationship with, uh, you know, the Music Educators Association, Art Educators, etc. But there isn't a music, uh, an industry organization here that uh, with whom we could partner. Though if there were, we certainly would want to. And Jennifer, do you find there's any problem in the... Uh, are there things that you cannot do uh, with the Jazz Institute, or is that a really very well integrated relationship? It, it, it's a well integrated relationship. Um, it's really, you know, a partnership. We we meet regularly on on all things related to the festival funding, especially. Are you involved in projects with the Jazz Institute that are not the festival itself? I mean, I know the uh, the Jazz Institute puts on programs in the park all year long, right? Right. Uh, the Jazz Institute of Chicago does programming year-round that we're not really involved in. I see. I see. Um, hmm. Could I uh, interject? Please. Um, um, as far as public and private funding and partnerships, uh, you know, my perception uh, is that uh, at the federal level, funds are going to continue to be pretty tight. Um, at the state level, they're gradually improving. Uh, and I'm talking about the arts. Um, the local level seems to be where the, the biggest action is today. And I think we, we see the greatest recovery at the local level. And 
and I don't. Know, I, there may be many different reasons for that, but certainly uh, local elected officials have the opportunity to see things happening firsthand as a result of that investment. And um, so, yeah, I I think at, at, in public funds, local is in fact a, a, a huge, huge deal. Uh, in fact, if I'm correct, um, my figures show. Uh, with over a billion dollars worth of arts funding in this country, 727 million of that is Jennifer. local public funding. And then I also believe that the greatest increases in this country are going to probably come through uh, public-private partnerships, with private being the great influxes um, of, of uh, funding in that relationship. Let me take a moment to remind the audience that uh, questions can be asked. We're going to um, talk for another 25 minutes or so, but if you have questions, uh, this is the time to begin offering them to our panelists. Um, my friend uh, uh, Steve Malgodi from uh, Florida says, so the bottom line is that there has to be an active community supporting the artists. If there's no community to support and there's no music in the community, and Michael, you're suggesting that the funding also on the local level, the community grassroots uh, level or funding is what's going to uh, accrue and work its way up. And also, it sounds like bringing that kind of support for, polit for political, for legislation that Cedric wants to see happen at the federal level. So we have to go from the bottom up in these things. Yeah. I believe so, um, yeah. And it, uh, do any of the three of you do direct contact with jazz audiences, trying to audience build? Is that a project that falls under, or is it all event driven? Well, uh, Michael here, um, it's interesting you make that comment because what you're talking about is the demand side of the arts. And I think the funding of the arts in this country has generally taken a, su a supply side model. and um, and uh, there may be something to that. I mean, there may be a real future in seriously looking at how we we address the demand side model of of uh, support for the, the the cultural life of this country. Uh, I, I'm not sure what it means yet, um, um, but this is something that's been much in my mind, uh, and it hasn't been lost on me that we've been uh, using a supply side model of support for the arts in this country. So what does the man side look? And I think that question um, gets right to the matter about uh, uh, direct contact with jazz audiences as opposed to the producers of jazz. Jennifer, have you seen the uh, jazz audience in Chicago change, grow, or diminish in the uh -huh. 20 years that you've been working on the festival? Oh, I, I think our jazz community has grown in the 20 years that I've been working on the festival. Um, you know, there's lots of presenters here in Chicago, the, um, whether it's the Umbrella Music Festival, the um, Asian American Jazz Festival, the High Park Jazz Festival, and just, you know, the number of jazz clubs here nurturing and our college jazz programs and high school level jazz programs, I think is growing and nurturing an audience here, so. Cedric, do you need information of that sort, and can you get information of that sort? Is it available? Often we hear, like when the NEA report came down, it was, oh, you know, the jazz audience is diminishing some by X percentage. Uh, how, uh, do you need information that says, no, it's not? Well, see, I, I, I think that there's so much jazz going on. I mean, I, the audience is diminishing. But then on the other hand, one of the things that you hear is jazz being available more and more. I mean, in, in uh, I live in Washington, D.C., of course, and in a neighborhood that is uh, overwhelmingly with restaurants, clubs, etc., more of them are offering jazz as part of their uh, staple. Um, more places for artists to work. Um, and so I'm encouraged by that. Um, on the other hand, you know, you, you look at at uh, 
not just the the let's say commercial establishments and their interest in presenting jazz, but I'm seeing uh, nonprofit organizations, even faith-based organizations, uh, taking interest in that as well. Here in D.C., we have what we call the jazz, which every Friday night, and it's, this has been for the last 15 years, presents local jazz musicians. It costs five dollars to get in. The musicians always get paid, and the place is always packed. And the church makes its ends selling food in the church basement. These folks took pews out of the sanctuary and put chairs in there so they can facilitate people getting their food, coming upstairs, eating while they watch the music, and then cleaning up when when the show is over and the people are gone. Uh, they make a killing selling fish, chicken wings, so on and so forth. And this is the, the uh, Westminster Presbyterian Church. Fifteen years, every Friday night. That got so popular that now on Monday, they have Blue Monday. Uh -huh. So the blues community comes out uh -huh. in the same way. So it's a nonprofit entity uh, that the church has a, um, what do you call it, a community economic development corporation, and it's under that that banner, the, that, that nonprofit office, that they do. This. And they're doing it extremely successfully. So that's, that's encouraging to me to see, you know, uh, more... Uh, um, Entities embracing the music and and promoting it, supporting it, and 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 we have, in in my view, you know, a fairly uh, robust jazz community here, so that you can hear the community places, some of these venues where uh, the college students can come with their instrument and and participate in the jam session, and then up at the the high end, you've got the major commercial clubs. Some of you may have heard of Blues Alley in Georgetown here in Washington D.C. You know where the national acts come in. Well, that student can't go in there and and get up on stage, uh, but there are places elsewhere where he get in front of a respectable uh, and respectful audience. Hmm. So I'm encouraged by all of that. I think you know what I'm trying to do with the promulgation piece of this bill is to foster more of, of that so that not just uh, entrepreneurs can continue to self-produce their CDs, sell them out of their car trunk if necessary, but presenting organizations can get the technical support they need um, and you to, to put on shows uh, with whatever frequency they're capable of so people can hear the music, that you bump into jazz if you go left or if you go right. Um, and, and, and then another important piece, jazz on the radio. That's a place where I, I think things have suffered a bit. Uh, but I got a call from a guy a week or so ago who runs a jazz club here in town. He says, Cedric, um, I've been reading about local radio, and I'm thinking about getting into that so I can begin to project the music from my club further into the community beyond my walls. Hey, that's an exciting proposition. So we'll see where all of this goes. Well, this we is, just need to encourage it, right? Uh, I mean, this sort of speaks to the need uh, that the media is aware of to get funded, also. And I don't think that the media uh, can very easily apply for funding uh, at the state or local uh, or federal level. We're supposed to be able to take care of ourselves as commercial entities, basically. Um, a corporation for public broadcasting being the exception of, of helping it's out a national public we radio. Have, uh, or a, a set of community newspapers here in Washington, D.C. Um, that's kind of a, a, you know, one of, the same publisher co produces papers for different neighborhoods in the city. But there is a common column in all of them called Jazz Avenues, where a guy is, is writing a monthly column that that publisher has decided to carry in all of his publications and he reports monthly on what's happening in the jazz here. You know, so, you know, I don't know that that kind of thing is available in all places. You know, we've got a Pacifica jazz station here that signed on 30 years ago with Take the A Train. You know, it's kind of a station trying to be all things to all people, folk, and station, but you can still hear jazz there. 
Um, we once upon a time had another station here that was tied to a university. It was a 24-hour jazz station, uh, but they bit the dust back when this city was experiencing some financial troubles. That station got sold to C-SPAN. It's now C-SPAN Radio. Um, so, so you know, we, we need to use the media to uh, present, promote the music. And so you've got to work, I think, with, with broadcasters, magazine publishers, community newspaper publishers to try uh, a slot for or a seat at the table for jazz so that um, you know, we're not just relying on jazz is or jazz times or downbeat, right. uh, but you can find out about uh, jazz and you know what's happening with the community through the community newspaper um, that we always uh, um, utilize to stay in touch with our respective right. communities. Right. So Michael, there, there is a, certainly a struggle in the fight, and we need to support you guys yeah. as you seek to do that. We need to buy the publications that you're in, um, and, uh, and we just know that, you know, I don't know about jazz. What's up with you? Michael, what is the media landscape like in, in Boise and in greater Idaho that would possibly be doing coverage of jazz or other music like that? There are some small local papers around the state. Uh, they struggle like all newspapers do today, as you would expect. And uh, so they, um, uh, they're they receptive. They want material. So if there's something happening locally um, and people let them know about it, and, uh, you know, they'll be interested. Um, uh, but they, they certainly struggle today, uh, as we would expect. But my experience with them is that they that they they're very very supportive, and I, I don't mean just specifically of jazz, but of the cultural lives of their communities. Uh, they're they're interested in finding ways to support those um, you know a, a thriving cultural life in their community. They do need material, so for instance, they need to know ahead of time what is happening and and how that's relevant and who to contact and you know invite them. Yeah, you know, or, or I should say, they they need to invite the, the local journalists, sure, uh, so that the the journalist knows it's going to happen before it happens, as opposed to afterwards. It doesn't do anybody any good if it's afterwards. Right, right. Jennifer, I I know the media scene in Chicago pretty well, but wasn't a new office established either in connection with this, the mayor's office or uh, two two young men to create a uh, uh, Chicago. Uh, as a, uh, a musical tourist destination? Isn't yes, like we, it's a division within our arts programming team um, headed up by um, Dylan and David that yes, that, that's their initiative that they just started working on was increasing, but they're really helping you know the musicians in terms of radio in Chicago and jazz. Um, I mean, not since the days of our public radio, BEZ, I mean, we have the smaller stations, the College of DuPage, w, um, DCB, and HPK, but um, we don't, you know, we, we partner with both of those local smaller stations in promoting jazz and what's going on. And um, I just lost my train of thought. Um, well, of, course, of course, you've got a major critic there in Howard Reich at the Tribune. Oh, yes. But also, there are community papers, and the readers still has some presence, a weekly, uh, free weekly. Are, are you fine? Do, do you keep track of coverage, even of the of the jazz festival itself? Uh, oh yes, our PR department tracks all all the coverage of, of the festivals. Have you found that it moves into internet? Uh, you know, blogging. Uh, is there more coverage? Buzz going around on Facebook and you know tweets that are you, you can see the hashtag grow or anything like that. Uh, the Facebook numbers have definitely grown. Um, not so much tweets. I don't know if we did tracking of that this year. Um, but just even the hits to the website and all of that and where we started posting video clips and music samples and things like that have all increased. And hmm, would the city have any way of, of funding or supporting uh, organized media that was trying to... Uh, have greater penetration, either prior to the jazz festival, or in April, or you know, all through the year. 
if that kind of program was devised, would there be something in the city government that could be applied for? It would probably fall within our marketing and PR department, and I really can't speak on that because I'm not sure. Michael, is there funding for media um, through the Idaho Commission on the Arts? Generally, no. Uh, we, we are restricted. We cannot uh, fund for-profit entities. Uh -huh. um, we, we, can, we can fund not-for-profit entities. So uh, if there was a non-profit radio station, you might be able to fund that. Oh, yeah, yeah, because there's a, uh, a broad, uh, for instance, um, oh, gosh, I, I don't like to deal in hypotheticals because uh, we haven't really funded any broadcast <laughs> work, uh, to my knowledge, at least not in my tenure. But, uh, but yeah, a, a not-for-profit entity that is going to um, deliver some public good in, in the arts in the state, we, we would be interested in. And, Cedric, is there anything in the uh, preservation and promulgation legislation that um, would speak directly to, to media uh, coverage or, you know, historical coverage, collections of that or anything along those lines? Uh, <coughs> Howard, I can't hear you guys anymore. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh oh, yeah, we can hear you. You can't hear me at all. Uh oh, we're uh, winding down then, thanks to Google, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> the Google Hangouts are still developing. Let me just mention a couple of things that have come in from guests. Uh, what efforts are being made directly to jazz audiences? Well, we discussed that a little bit. Um, I agree, examining the demand side, ask audiences what they want, maybe through encouraging <laughs> subscriptions at multiple levels for seniors, students, and those new to jazz. Governmental support of that, uh, encouraging subscriptions, is I guess what this person is saying. Um, yeah, uh, tourism, advertising, okay, all that, and then people are saying, yes, we're having a hard time hearing Cedric. So, um, I think that we, uh, do you have a closing statement, Michael? It looks like you're about to say something. Well, yeah, um, uh, uh, the, the th thoughts on advertising and tourism um, definitely uh, get my attention because I, I believe that um, uh, local CVBs, you know, convention visitor bureaus, mm -hmm. I think they can play essential roles in getting the word out um, uh, on the tourism end of it. Uh, uh, working with local media and not just print media, but their their online uh, their online divisions uh, to make sure that people know in advance of events what's going to happen. And um, you know, we we actually have a very good relationship with uh, with media in our state, so we're able to give them heads up about important events that are happening in Idaho, uh, and uh, so that they can be prepared to cover it. Uh, and I would hope that uh, that would happen at the local level too. Uh, you know, jazz journalists. Um, I, in closing here, I have to say, uh, from early on in our discussions this evening, uh, a, a thought came into my head, and it's not an original one. It came from a, a friend of mine, but uh, I thought of the, the the adage, "Who tells the stories?" Huh. And uh, you know, uh, in the bigger picture, I think of that in terms of the artists themselves, who tell our stories as a society, and that's the 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 artists. And in our case, we're talking about the jazz artists themselves. But jazz journalists have a role to play in telling that story, uh, and I believe it's an essential role, uh, telling the story uh, in a compelling way to to make sure that uh, audiences uh, understand that there is something here for them and that they really need to take a listen and, and go to that club. Go to that uh, Presbyterian church and check it out, you know. <laughs> and, uh, the, and, and the jazz journalist has a major role in helping that happen as a storyteller. Thank you. That's good to hear. Jennifer, you love us, don't you? Of course. <laughs> Everyone should come to the Jazz Festival Labor Day weekend. Make plans now. <laughs> That's a good idea. The Jazz Festival in Chicago on Labor Day weekend, the Jazz Festival in Moscow, Idaho in February, and, uh, and D.C. anytime. That's right. It's a great scene also. So um, 
thank you very much for your participation tonight. It's really been great to have Cedric Kendricks, and I'm sorry that uh, you had to drop out here, and Michael Faison from the Idaho Commission on the Arts, and, and Jennifer Washington from uh, the Chicago uh, Mayor's Office of Special Events. Um, the Jazz Journalists Association uh, has to thank, of course, again, uh, the Jazz Crews for sponsoring our... I want to look at Oh, now you're back. Uh, <laughs> the Jazz Crews for sponsoring our Talking Issues uh, webinar series and also Central Cent Century Media Partners, which provides some additional support. Our next um, uh, Talking Issues is going to be on December 18th. We're going to be talking about uh, jazz dis diplomacy now, jazz outside this country, how we get the information out. And Danilo Perez, uh, pianist with Wayne Shorter and uh, uh, director of the Panama Jazz Festival, will be on that panel. So will Simon Rowe from the Dave Brubeck Institute. So uh, this session will be archived on YouTube. Uh, everything will be seen and heard as it happened. And that's what makes uh, Talking Issues very exciting webinars to have. Uh, they're all live, and they can continue to have life on the web. So thanks, everybody, for your participation tonight. And uh, we'll be in further touch. There's more to talk about. Thanks a lot. Good night. Thanks, Howard. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.